Right. Well, um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome uh, to this uh, very, very uh, interesting, we hope for you and for everybody, event today uh, on the unfortunate unfolding crisis in Ukraine and the many, many uh, rip ripple effects that it has had and will have in uh, re reconfiguring many things, East-West relations, relations with Russia, relations between uh, uh, the United States and its NATO friends, and of course, uh, what will be the future of this uh, country, Ukraine, that is now uh, sadly at the center of attention. My name is Paolo von Schirach. Uh, I serve as both the chair of political science and international relations at Bay Atlantic University and also as president of the Global Policy Institute. This uh, webinar is jointly sponsored by both Bay Atlantic University and the Global Policy Institute. With us today, we have three very, very senior distinguished experts that hopefully will help us understand a bit better uh, what's happening on the ground. We are inundated with information, a lot of it uh, contradictory and complicated for the average you know, observer, and hopefully our experts here will help us understand what's going on. I will not, you know, belabor in uh, reciting the long and, uh, uh, you know, impressive uh, resumes of uh, of the of the panelists. You received their bios along with the flyers. But suffice to say, we've got Dan Goray here in Washington, who is, uh, you know, a, a foremost a keen uh, expert on NATO, U.S. defense spending, Pentagon, U.S. foreign policy, and more. From London. We have Michael Binion, uh, old friend and very, very seasoned observer of East-West relations, having been here in Washington, in Brussels, and of course in Moscow, and being uh, you know, a, a writer and commentator and an editorialist for the Times in, 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 in London. And last, but by no means least, uh, Ewald König, based in Berlin, who is uh, originally Austrian, but transplanted successfully in Germany, and based in Berlin, and he has been there for decades, and he has observed many, many developments from the fall of the Soviet Union to the reunification, or rather, I should say, reunification of Germany's fall of the Soviet Union, expansion of NATO, and of course, this unfolding crisis in Ukraine. So welcome to all of you gentlemen, and thank you for making time. Uh, I know you're all very busy, uh, especially now, uh, and so for making time to, to be with us uh, today. Let me just, uh, without you know, trying to summarize this thing, which everybody, I suppose, knows more or less what's going on on the ground. We've got you know, the first major war of aggression in Europe since uh, Hitler invaded uh, you know, uh, Poland in 1939. I guess that's kind of been said many, many times. But let me ask you this, just to, just to lay the uh, kind of the terms of what's going on. How, where, where do you see an end game here? If we would reconvene uh, on the same subject to talk about NATO, deterrent, Ukraine, you know, what's happening in Russia a year from now, what would we see? Uh, let me ask you this. Just try to give it your best shot. And I know, you know, as the man said, predictions are, are very difficult, especially about the future, right? So <laughs> let me ask you to try nonetheless, and give it your best shot. Starting with you, Dan. I mean, what, a year, if we reconvene a year from now, what are we going to see? Uh, what I believe we are going to see a year from now as this unfolds is in fact, uh, by all other measures, a new Cold War. You will have a hostile border of more than a thousand miles running between, between Russia and, and NATO, running from the Baltic essentially down to uh, the Black Sea. Uh, it, may, uh, excuse me. it may involve uh, a number of, of uh, variations on this. And the reason I say this is I don't see how this uh, conflict uh, stops short of uh, the occupation of Ukraine in totality by Russia. Uh, there have been people who have talked about they're going to pick up just the, the eastern half down to the Dnieper River, and, and then what? Leave a, uh, a recalcitrant, hostile, if somewhat truncated, western Ukraine 
to 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 just sit there and and uh, try and uh, um, uh, undermine what the Russians are doing. So I think this is going to go all the way to the Polish, uh, Romanian, Slovakian uh, 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 border. Uh, it is going to be a dogged, ugly war, which means that both sides are going to continue. Both sides now, including NATO and and Europe, the U.S., along with with uh, uh, Ukraine are going to essentially continue to make this a war, uh, the image of war as one of democracy and free people versus uh, uh, dictatorship and, and aggression. And uh, we're going to see the continual de redeployment of NATO forces eastward, certainly US forces. We're now into discussions about the permanent deployment of additional US uh, ground forces in Eastern Europe, in the Baltic. Uh, remember when, when if, Ukraine is completely absorbed. You now have a 64 mile corridor, the new Fulda Gap. It will be the Slovaki corridor, the Slovaki Gap between Kaliningrad and Belarus, uh, highly vulnerable to, to Russian movement, or at least we worried that it was highly vulnerable. Not clear whether the Russian army is as fast afoot as we thought they were, but nonetheless. Uh, and so both sides are going to move in ways that essentially reinforce the idea of a, a new Cold War, a new confrontation between alliances. The economics uh, of this, including what the President uh, Biden and, and the allies have done today with the elimination of most favored nations status and all the rest, I expect Russia to respond, uh, including by seizing the assets of Western companies that have uh, abandoned Russia. And so there will essentially be a decoupling economically, a, a uh, growing hostility militarily, and a political, uh, perceptual, psychological problem between the two sides that leaves sort of very little room for anything but uh, a kind of, if you will, a bit of an armed confrontation a year from now. Just a quick follow up before I, before I yield the floor to our, to our other guests. Quick, quick question. Do you think that the Ukrainian resistance, I mean, you, you, you posit that Russia will continue until they occupy the entire country. Do you think that there will be a continued guerrilla warfare, insurrection, whatever you want to call it, resistance on the part of the Ukrainians, assuming continuing Western assistance uh, indefinitely, as some people argue, or that at some point the Ukrainians will say, you know what, we're done. We tried, but we're exhausted. We give up. Do you see? How do you see that? You know that that is that is such a hard thing to to predict. Certainly, most of Ukraine is not really conducive to classic guerrilla tactics. You don't have the kind of culture and society we've seen in Afghanistan, Iraq, other places where protracted guerrilla wars have occurred. I mean, something like that or resistance, I think, is inevitable of some kind. Whether it is a passive resistance, whether it is, you know. Uh, pouring sand in the gas tanks of, uh, of Russian military vehicles on the side, not the kind of thing we saw in, in the Middle East. I don't know. There may be some parts of Western Ukraine that are more prone also because of the difference in, in, in the culture of the, two, of the two halves of the country that may be more prone to, to uh, continued resistance. But there is going to be at the very minimum a angry, sullen, restive population with, let's remember, certainly in the Western part, but other parts of, of Europe, uh, Western Ukraine and other parts of Europe has a lot of connections. I mean, this is this is going to be, a, if you will, kind of a psychic transmission belt from the ugliness of Ukraine into Eastern Europe and from there to, to all of Europe. I don't see any way for for the alliance, for the EU to, to sort of avoid uh, uh, this problem or to go back to anything even approximately business as usual for, for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Michael, uh, to you, same question. How do you see this a year from now and any other observation you want to make? Well, I think a year from now, fighting will have finished. It will continue very bloody and very uh, uh, costly to the Ukrainians, obviously, but also very costly to the Russians. We have seen far many more casualties, including several generals, which the Russians didn't expect. And we've seen uh, through intelligence reports considerable backlash in the higher echelons of the Russian government. A lot of people are appalled at uh, what has happened and appalled at the lack of previous intelligence that gave them a possible uh, realistic scenario of whether or not this was going to be a possible operation. And there will be a backlash there. Um, I don't see Putin 
uh, ousted, uh, I, but I do see a, um, a turning away from his absolute authority. Uh, remember, it was only two years after the Cuba fiasco, uh, Cuba, I mean, fiasco in terms of the Soviet Union, that Khrushchev was ousted. Uh, it's not easy to oust the president. It's much easier if you have a Politburo where you can just be outvoted, uh, which happened. But how they would get rid of Putin and whether he would respond to the huge immiseration of Russian society, which is going to happen, massive cutbacks in living standards, deep discontent, isolation, pariah status, all that. What I think that means is it will push Russia soon into being, uh, I won't say accommodating, but ready to find some kind of partial solution which they will declare a victory. And I don't think it will mean the full occupation of Ukraine. What it will mean is a Finland solution. It will be what happened to Finland after they lost a very bloody war against the Russians who took a large part of their territory. They had to sign Stalin's so-called peace treaty in 1948, which imposed very draconian restrictions on their external foreign policy. Ukraine essentially will have to agree never to join any alliance. In other words, never to join NATO. Uh, and they might have to say they won't be a member of the EU, but that doesn't matter as I don't think the EU is ready to admit them. Uh, but that would mean that they might be allowed to continue their own kind of policy, uh, independent foreign policy with so-called friendship with Russia as the main uh, element of it. I agree entirely with Dan, there will be a continuing Cold War. There will be furious backlash from the Ukrainian leadership having been forced to make a fairly humiliating agreement, but we've already seen direct negotiations begin, believe it or not, while the bombs are falling between uh, the uh, foreign ministers of both Russia and Ukraine. I think there may even be a possible meeting, I, I can't really see it, but some kind of either face-to-face -face or meeting via intermediaries where Putin would have to be involved, possibly brokered by the Chinese, who are the only ones who have any credibility now with Russia and on whom Russia depends enormously for possibly its economic survival. Uh, and I think therefore there will be some sort of imposed settlement which will be humiliating to Ukraine, but it pretty humiliating also to the Russians. Uh, and I think the, the outcome of that will be that uh, Putin actually pays the price in a year or two, one way or the other. Thank you for that. Uh, Ewald, uh, your, your, your thoughts from your perspective, uh, uh, you know, in, as an expert in East-West relations, how do you see this uh, a year from now? So me, I'm afraid that the worst is yet to come. Uh, the blitzkrieg of uh, Putin did not work, and now uh, they will continue their aggression, but also the Ukrainians will continue to resist and to defend uh, themselves uh, for a long time. And uh, there we will see, we will face a lot of blood and uh, damages and uh, destroying. But uh, at the end, it is uh, Putin who uh, who will be um, yeah, the loser, I'm quite sure. Although in Europe, there are some governments, uh, a few governments of the European Union member states, um, uh, which uh, already try to keep the dialogue uh, with Putin for the case, um, if the war is ended one day and uh, Putin is still in power, and then they have to continue to talk with him because there is nobody else. I think this is a little bit too optimistic and too early, but uh, of course, uh, parallel to the military aggression, um, the negotiations and the dialogues and diplomatic efforts um, must not stop. There is always a need for them. Although it is very uh, difficult because we see that uh, Putin and his regime they are always lying. Also, the foreign minister Lavrov, uh, we only hear lies from him. Um, although we do not know how far is his influence to Putin personally today, we do not know. And um, yes, uh, we have also heard in, uh, from the Russian ambassador in Berlin, um, it was uh, two or three months ago, uh, literally, he said, um, Russia will never invade 
Ukraine. Also, the Russian ambassador to the EU in Brussels said the same. Russia will never invade the Ukraine. I don't think that they wanted to lie. I think that they themselves were victim of the lie of the Kremlin. So in one year, I'm afraid we will still uh, see the war. Maybe we have to be um, thankful if there is nothing with a nuclear plant, which is affecting then the rest of Europe. And um, yes, and we will see if the NATO still is uh, reluctant and uh, not um, involving and uh, how long the European Union is uh, continuing to supply weapons, also lethal weapons, which is very interesting. I think the one hour that we have for this webinar will be too short. We, there are so many aspects uh, which are very interesting. But just to follow up on that, uh, Ewald, obviously, you know, as I mentioned before we went uh, live, you know, clearly everybody is uh, shocked, but in a good way to see, at least in terms of policy declarations, the turnaround of Germany, turnaround in, in a good sense, that uh, what uh, Putin seems to have done in, in, with this invasion is what uh, we never succeed to doing in terms of, uh, con in terms of convincing uh, you know, the chancellor predecessor, Angela Merkel, to do in 16 years. That is to keep up defense spending and to do all the good things that we expect from a key NATO ally. You know, when I read that the, the German Bundeswehr went from 5,000 battle tanks down to 300, I said, oh my God, that's what the Boy Scouts? Is this, is this, is this the German army? And, you know, and, and, uh, and again, this is a precipitous decline. And now the chancellor said, no, no, we're going to turn around. And not only that, he also announced plans to diversify at the very least, uh, you know, German energy supplies. And we know that's a huge problem. Announced, uh, I guess, the construction of uh, new uh, liquefied natural gas uh, terminals to receive LNG, possibly from the United States or from Qatar or from other countries, and on and on. Do you see this having, because that's really critical. Germany is the key country in, in, on the NATO you know, central front, and it's always been there. And the fact that, that people were beginning to dismiss uh, Germany as kind of a pacifist, you know, essentially virtually a country with uh, neutral ambitions rather than being a key ally, and that this is kind of turning around. Do you see this as a lasting uh, transformation or is just a, an emotional response to the crisis of the moment? Because if it's a lasting transformation, then it plays uh, with what Dan was saying a moment ago, that we're gonna see a, a united Cold War front, Cold War 2.0, and we're back to good old fashioned containment. Uh, you know, and Mr. Kennan, I don't know if he's, if he's watching us, what's he gonna say? You know, he said, oh, I said all that. Remember the long telegram? You know, I announced all this and I wrote it. So, uh, but anyway, what, how do you see that? Do you see, since you're right there in Berlin and you, and you have the pulse of German politics and public opinion, how do you see that? I'm convinced this is not a moment of emotion, but this will be a, a long-term uh, turning uh, point. It is unbelievable. Usually a new government has uh, around about uh, 100 days of a grace period. And uh, it, especially this left-wing government in Berlin, uh, you know, there are three coalition partners, the Social Democrats and the Green Party, they are left wing, and then the Liberals, the FDP. Um, so they have run about 100 days now, and from the very first day, they were challenged. There is uh, no idea of, uh, of a grace period, and uh, they have, they had to uh, to uh, redefine re uh, all the things that they have in the coalition treaty. That means all the things that had been a taboo for left-wing parties in last years and in recent decades, um, they are not taboo, especially the 2% two person, two percent of the GDP, which were asked of Germany for a long time and uh, Germany had less than 1.5% uh, uh, and now this left-wing government 
um, has to, um, to bring more and, and promised more than 2% of the GDP for military um, uh, expenses. And um, also the, the energy politics, yeah? especially this government with the Green Party has to prolong uh, the coal uh, plants, for instance, and uh, to, uh, to um, they are in charge to secure the energy supply uh, for the people in, also in the next winter. And uh, so the climate change is not the priority, but uh, the security of energy supply is the, uh, the, the priority. And, um, and um, also the reform of uh, the German army of the Bundeswehr. And there are so many things which uh, have been unbelievable unbelievable before a couple of weeks ago. And now this uh, left-wing German, uh, left-wing government uh, is in charge for these things. Uh, unbelievable if we now had still a, a conservative uh, government, a coalition led by conservatives, uh, what would be the position by the left-wing uh, opposition? Unbelievable. So it's really, as you uh, asked in the, in, the, in the beginning, a wonder. Uh, it's yeah, it's astonishing, and uh, we see what uh, President Putin has uh, achieved so far. Uh, a shift of um, opinions, also in the population, not only in the government, and a, un a unity in European Union that we did not have for a long time, a unity in NATO that we did not have for a long time, and uh, the new. Um, strategy in energy politics and uh, all these things are extremely new and are the result of Putin's aggression and uh, there is also a, a new um, re-establishment of the so-called Weimar Triangle in German Weimar Dreieck uh, which is not so well known maybe in the USA, but it, it, in the beginning, after the fall of the Iron Curtain, it was a very important um, body uh, consisting of the three most important countries of the EU, namely Germany, France, and uh, Poland. Um, but after the many problems uh, with the Polish government, um, we, uh, th there was, uh, yes, it was seemingly dead. Yeah, but now, uh, as the Pol as Poland is playing a big role in in uh, accepting the refugees, uh, unbelievable, um, and also as a, a front a country, as a neighbor uh, to the Ukraine, and uh, always having uh, warned, like the Baltics, always having warned. Um, uh, because of the aggression of, um, of uh, Russia. So this uh, triangle, so-called Weimar triangle, uh, is reanimated and reestablished. And, and this can, can also be a big uh, factor for the future. Great. Michael, to you, how, how do you see that from Britain? You know, you look at on the other side of the, of the channel, and you look at Europe and you say, OK, this is what we say we're going to do this and that. The uh, energy vulnerability is well known to everybody. Russia is a major supplier of both uh, natural gas and, and to some extent oil, lesser extent, but certainly significant. How, how do we get out of this? In other words, uh, you know, declaring we're going to do this and we're going to do that is fantastic. But where is the new supply? How do you develop the alternatives, in particular, since until yesterday, the word was, uh, you know, green energy, let's go renewable, you know, uh, climate change. That's this is really the priority for the continent and also here in the United States to a large extent since the Biden administration took office a year ago. So is that all forgotten? Now we're going to say, OK, forget climate change, forget this, forget that. We need the real stuff and the real stuff is oil and gas because that's what that's what's realistically uh, you know, available. On the other hand, if Russian supplies are gone off the market and not available, how does Europe do? I mean, how do you materialize uh, the you know five million? I think it is 
barrels of oil from Russia coming from somewhere else. It's just not available. Not even if the Saudi Arabia you know, pumps at full throttle, it's just not there. How is Europe, both of you, I ask, uh, Michael first and then Dan, um, how, how does Europe manage this? And I see that as a real Achilles heel in all this. Maybe I'm wrong, but Michael, to you. Well, Europe can't really manage in the short term. I mean, even uh, the people who have been taking the toughest line with Germany understand you simply cannot cut off all Germany's oil and gas overnight. That would be the collapse of all German industry and hence basically the collapse of all European industry. It's simply unrealistic. But you can reduce the amount imported from Russia as quickly as possible. Now, Britain is in the lucky position that it has imports very little gas from Russia, 3% at most. It's also in a fairly lucky position of having reserves of its own in the North Sea, which have been run down partly because of climate change and partly because people feel they didn't need to exploit these reserves. Those are going to be stepped up immediately. New exploration in the North Sea, more gas uh, essentially also and oil from Norway, from which Britain gets a great deal of its gas, a massive increase in imported gas from the Gulf. One would hope there would be more energy exported from America. We haven't heard much about America coming to the rescue of Europe with its energy exports, in fact, very little. And one would have thought that if America was really trying to show solidarity, there would have been an immediate increase in shipments of uh, oil or gas. The problem is, of course, shipments take a long time to get there. They're expensive. You've got to have the uh, facilities to receive both liquefied natural gas and oil imports coming by ship. I mean, obviously, by pipeline, it's so much easier. But there will be a massive effort to diversify and also a massive new effort to go into uh, non-polluting energy. So I think wind uh, power, for example, again, this takes time. But uh, Britain has just changed the law to now allow as many wind stations to be built onshore as possible. Previously, we had stopped that and had them only built offshore in the sea. That will now change. Uh, nuclear energy, uh, I think uh, Germany, I think, has uh, delayed the abolition of all its nuclear energy, and I think that might actually be delayed indefinitely. Uh, and nuclear energy clearly is going to be one of the answers. Again, none of these things can be done straight away. They take a long time. In the immediate short term, and we're talking the next couple of months or so, there is no alternative to uh, importing gas and oil from Russia. But uh, reducing supplies substantially is possible because most countries have enough gas to last until the coming winter, gas and oil. Uh, what they need urgently now to do is build up their reserves. Dan, to you, again, starting from the premise that we're trying to uh, bolster and, and strengthen NATO, you know, uh, an alliance uh, that, that has to buy energy from its enemy, it's a really strange alliance. So uh, what's, what's your take on, on this angle of, of, of Europe's uh, uh, energy dependence? And also to some extent, the United States, although much, much smaller extent, thanks to fracking and, and the other things that we've been doing for the last decade or so. How, how do you view that? Is that a permanent Achilles heel in Europe? Or, or, or as our two friends here have indicated, this can somehow be fixed? I don't think it can be fixed in, in the near term. It, as, as Michael was saying, you know, it takes time and real time, years, to really restructure the, the energy sector. Uh, frankly, if you are going to try and do uh, a full out, full court press for the United States to aid Europe, it would still take time to do things like build LNG terminals on both sides of, of the Atlantic. I mean, we have, a, we have a deficit on our side as well if we're going to be shipping out. Nonetheless, I think that this is what is going to happen. Commitments will start to be made, as Michael was saying, some have been made by the UK. Uh, this administration, the United US administration has sort of re been reluctantly pushed in a number of directions by the crisis and the invasion. And one of the areas that it is really holding on to for dear life still is its green agenda. I have a great feeling as oil prices continue to rise, and they will, uh, that that is going to go by the wayside. That is, they will still make the right descriptions. You'll still have money in all the various bills for wind power and solar power and the rest, but that a lot of the restrictions on energy, perhaps not the Keystone pipeline because that's such a, uh, a flag to the bull as, you, as it were to the climate change people, but in terms of opening up the spigots, allowing drilling, allowing pipelines from fields, 
allowing LNG ports to be created. That is all going to happen. Uh, I, it, it may happen ahead of the November elections, if certainly afterwards. Uh, with oil prices going the way they are and the current situation, the, the idea of blaming this on Putin is not going to last. Uh, Americans know that uh, there was oil and gas available in this country prior to the Biden administration, enough to essentially uh, inure us to, to a Russian uh, boycott or, or a halting of gas and oil sales from Russia. Uh, and I think that uh, this administration is going to see the writing on the wall very clearly and change its policies. I mean, it, said it may be exactly the same kind of tectonic movement by the Biden administration that you all said that you, you saw with the German political thing. I mean, that's going to be the real test. If you see that kind of change in the U.S., then essentially the world, uh, the, the, the balance here in terms of politics and, and how international relations played uh, will have changed fundamentally for us as well. Okay, so we, we see uh, from, if I read you correctly, gentlemen, uh, you see changes, lasting changes, that this is not a, a momentary emotional, you know, from the heart response to the crisis of the day that this is gonna last, that this is really Cold War 2.0 again. Now, in terms of the, you know, some of you alluded to that, but you, it looks like that this time around, uh, sanctions against Russia are biting. You know, we've seen before efforts to say, well, we'll sanction here, we'll sanction there. The Trump administration, you know, was gonna strangle Iran essentially to death in order to force them to change their stance on their nuclear programs and regional meddling and blah, blah, blah. And yes, the Iranians suffered greatly uh, because of the impact of US sanctions, but that they didn't cry uncle. They didn't say, oh no, sorry, sorry, we're done. You know, please we'll sign whatever you want. In fact, they engaged in more mischief, um, in, uh, arguably, at least in terms of, uh, of, uh, of rekindling their nuclear program. Now, Russia is bigger than Iran, but the sanctions are bigger too. Do you see the, this as a really, really biting deeply into the Russian society? Of course, we know that the media have a fun telling us of the oligarchs that, you know, in London, as you know very well, Michael, see their properties that are confiscated or the yachts and, you know, being impounded, blah, blah, blah. That's kind of fun to, to watch. Uh, but is this real? In other words, is the damage that to, to the Russian economy, to their entire international standing, to the ability to do trade finance, to get all the stuff that we know, is this going to, first of all, bite really? And, and is it going to change the equation significantly? In other words, to force Putin to be, let's say, more conciliatory because of the damage inflicted on their society. I'll start with you, Ewald, and then everybody. Mm -hmm. I think the damage is really uh, very big in the Russian uh, population. Um, the most uh, strict uh, sanction is, I think, the exclusion of the SWIFT, the SWIFT uh, payment system for a lot of banks, and uh, so that uh, people cannot yeah, spend money. Also, the oligarchs uh, cannot spend money, and uh, yes, uh, and uh, also that uh, European companies uh, who have plants in Russia um, are going to close them. Uh, for instance, Volkswagen and other big companies. That means many thousands of people now are laid off. They are unemployed. Yeah, and uh, so on. So the Russians are famous for being able to suffer a lot, but one day it will be too much, I think so. Yeah? So the sanctions are a big damage uh, for Russia, for the population and also for the regime. But unfortunately, and of course, they are also big damage uh, for the Western countries um, for repercussion uh, measures and also one day for uh, retaliation measures uh, from Russia, especially the energy uh, supply. We know that um, it's half a billion or even one billion dollar a day uh, that um, Russia is um, 
earning money by uh, supplying uh, energy. And uh, so Germany is very much depending on this um, supply, on this imports. Uh, so about uh, 50 or 50, uh, 40 or 50%. An example, Austria, much more. I don't know what they are planning for the future. Okay, it's a neutral country. Um, so if the Germans would decide by themselves uh, to stop the consumption of uh, Russian uh, energy, uh, then they would have problems. In the same case, if Russian would uh, stop the export uh, to Germany, um, but um, the Germans are not prepared for this case. So if Germany uh, organizes LNG gas, it takes at least two years uh, to establish the terminals for that. And then we will be surprised that uh, Qatar, for instance, Qatar, which is uh, under criticism because of uh, labor, um, labor, um, standards and so on uh, before the championship of football, Qatar will be a friend in the future because uh, of uh, energy and also Iran and so on. But um, as, I, as I said, LNG importing is not possible in the next two years. And also saving energy, which will be one aspect is uh, little effect and uh, also the renewables uh, are very complicated in Germany because uh, the sun is not always shining, the wind is not always uh, windy and uh, Germany has decided to um, delete the nuclear plants and this is still taboo. There is uh, no plan to um, re-establish a nuclear plant. Uh, the only thing is to prolong the nuclear fire, uh, the, sorry, for the coal fired uh, um, power plants, which is against the green ideology, but they have to do it. So it's, it's a big challenge for the Germans. Uh, so they are interested in continuing uh, the contract with the Russians. And uh, also, the Russians need the money. Before I go to Michael, a very quick thing. Is Nord Stream 2 dead or is just paused? You think this is going to be just a nice piece of rust in the Baltic Sea that will never be activated or that at some point, miraculously, and, you know, gas will flow through Nord Stream 2? It's to you, uh, Ewald. Yeah. Yeah, to me, okay. Uh, Nord Stream 2 is uh, yeah, a big uh, topic in Germany, not in the moment because uh, there is no permission to launch it. Yeah, okay. Maybe one day uh, when it starts to be rusty, uh, it could be um, launched because uh, one day there is a time after Putin, and we also know that uh, Russians. Russia is not the same as Putin. So the Germans uh, always try to uh, make a difference between Putin and the Russians. Um, so Germany was uh, criticized by most of the EU uh, countries and especially uh, criticized by the USA uh, for um, having this uh, Nord Stream 2. And um, also, Personally, Mr. Gerhard Schröder, who is the former uh, chancellor, uh, was criticized very much. And even his uh, closest um, employed in his office, uh, they quit. And so he is alone in his office without his uh, people. But now um, he is in Moscow. Nobody knows um, how it uh, came in, 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 in effect. Yeah? And nobody knows, even the German government, even his social democratic party, nobody knows uh, what he is doing exactly, what he is uh, talking with Putin, if he has the, a chance uh, for a success. So it's a very big miracle. And uh, I, I think it's not very realistic that he can bring a breakthrough, although everybody knows that uh, he is a good friend of Putin and um, so he's very isolated in Germany 
and um, he could have success, then he is re, um, uh, readmitted. Readmitted, yes. Um, but um, so he was one of the promoters of Nord Stream 2. And uh, so it, it will be empty for a long time, maybe forever. Nobody knows. Understood. Michael, to you, uh, you how, how do you see now, again, if we shift back uh, the situation on the ground in Ukraine itself? And I know is anybody's guess what's really happening. Uh, we, I think we, there's some kind of a consensus here that Russia is not going to give up, that there is no scenario here whereby Putin said, oh my God, I really made a huge mistake here. How do I get out of this thing? That he wants something. Now, the question is, how much does he want? The whole thing after having pummeled, you know, all the cities of Ukraine to a rubble, and that will take a while, or, or there's some kind of accommodation possible. But do you see, based on the information you have, that there is still determination on the part of the Ukrainians to engage in this feisty uh, guerrilla warfare, for lack of a better word, uh, and keep challenging uh, the Russian invaders, or there are certain scenarios whereby they would say, okay, we can't do this anymore. How do you see that going on the ground and also the friction that all this, the, that this, all this attrition causes, the losses that the Russians are incurring? How, how do you see that going? I know it's complicated, but give us your best shot. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it depends what the Russian strategy now is. There, as um, uh, Ewald said, the original blitzkrieg, which they had in mind, obviously simply didn't work. Uh, now the alternative is what I'd call the Grozny solution, which is pretty brutal, which is what they did in Chechnya. Just bring in the bombers and flatten the cities till half the population is dead and the city lies in ruins. Now, I think even Russia would hesitate about doing that in Kiev because Kiev has a certain mystical mythological and spiritual importance for Russia. It was the center, the foundation of Christianity in uh, the Slav area, in, in Russia and, and around there. So Kiev is an important city for them. And also just to flatten all the cities and bomb more hospitals and kill more children, there comes a point where even with this draconian censorship, Russians have begin to wonder whether world condemnation is actually making, it makes his work. Uh, if they don't do that, then the Ukrainians could continue for some time. It depends how much help they get. Weapons help, stinger missiles and those sort of things help. They want air cover. And this is a real terrible moral dilemma for NATO. Uh, air cover actually would involve NATO uh, patrolling or NATO planes, even if no, flown by Ukrainian pilots, patrolling the airspace. And that for Russia would be NATO involvement, direct NATO involvement in this conflict, which is, of course, what Putin has accused them of right from the start. And it would actually, to some extent, um, bring credibility to the idea uh, that is being put around that Russia is being threatened by NATO, that Russia actually is fighting for its own survival. And I have to say, to some extent, this is what the sanctions have produced. I mean, for some people, of course, this is very painful, but a lot of ordinary Russians see pictures of Western uh, bars pouring uh, Russian vodka down the drain, uh, saying we're not going to play Tchaikovsky, saying you know conductors who don't speak out will be sacked. And they're beginning to say, this is a Russophobic onslaught on our culture, on our people, on us. And that will rally them round. Uh, and that of course is entirely the aim of Putin, to have the nation rally around in these difficult times. Now, it depends whether, um, uh, you know, that that sort of fear and anger that grows in the Russian population is outweighed by a sense of we've got into something which really shouldn't be doing. We must find a way out. And whether you can find, I think, what the Americans call an off ramp, a way of getting him down from where he is, uh, is quite difficult. It, it also depends on what we don't know is to what extent the military are beginning to say to him privately, you've got to think of something else. This is not working. Or the intelligence people are saying, we cannot hold all Ukraine indefinitely. Or he's thinking, um, I better bow to somebody if the Chinese say, you've got to settle this because this is damaging the entire world and our economy and your economy to the point where we can no longer support you. If the pressure is on him, then he's going to try and think of some sort of, some sort of way of, of moderating it. Uh, sanctions, I mean, they are 
important. Uh, they're certainly important as a gesture of solidarity. They will hurt. Uh, they are a two-edged sword. Of course, um, Britain was very slow in taking real measures against the oligarchs. They've done it now. And the one that has caused the most delight, but at the same time is the most dismay, is on uh, Roman Abramovich, who is the owner of Chelsea Football Club. And of course, the, the one thing that um, Brits are pretty worried about is what's going to happen to Chelsea Football Club, you know, champion winners and all that. They're threatening to be bankrupt. Uh, and that, that is showing that sanctions really do cut both ways. Uh, Dan, to you, uh, of course, everybody says, well, by doing this, by pushing uh, Russia in a corner, they are back in, in even much stronger embrace with China, which let's not forget in this whole crisis. Long term, in my opinion, I don't know if you gentlemen share this, but is the real significant, uh, you know, existential threat to the United States, not in, the, not in such a direct manner like armed assault against Ukraine, although we may see something in Taiwan sooner or later. But, but the, the Chinese essentially want to be us. There's no chance that Russia is going to be us. But the Chinese want to be us, and they have a long-term, multi-pronged approach to all that, So which is outside our topic today, maybe for another conversation. But we know that, uh, what, what is it, how Xi Jinping described it, that, that uh, the relationship now between China and Russia has no boundaries, has no, no limits, it's, it's, it's everything and forever. Can China save Russia economically? In other words, certainly China can buy more hydrocarbon from Russia, provided the, the construction of the necessary uh, delivery infrastructure, which to my knowledge, doesn't, I mean, there's some, but not that much at, at, to this day. But can conceivably, uh, you know, China rescue Russia from the uh, hardships in, of the Western sanctions, uh, Dan? Do you think they can do it? Uh, I think they ni neither can do it nor will do it. I mean, this is an extraordinarily expensive enterprise. This is, uh, it reminds me a little bit historically of. Uh, Nazi Germany trying to sort of keep propping up uh, Mussolini's Italy. Every time they went off on their own, the Germans had to come in and sort of help, help them out because they couldn't do it. This is a case in which there isn't really an advantage to, to, to China out of this, this conflict. They could have had Russian oil and Russian uh, grain uh, at any point. What this is really going to harm is the international trading environment on which China truly depend. So I, I had originally thought uh, three months ago, four months ago, that NATO might be able to save Putin from Ukraine by acting more aggressively uh, and, if you will, uh, pre-igniting some sanctions and such. Now, China probably is the only country that in some way can, in fact, uh, uh, save, save Putin. Uh, on the other hand, one might argue that a Cold War in Asia, or in Europe rather, does uh, help China's long-term plans. We know the U.S. Army in particular, the U.S. military, is now having to rethink the notion of uh, Indo-Pacific first uh, and, and how it's going to deploy and what systems it's going to build. Uh, that may be you know, seen in Beijing as, an, as a net advantage. Uh, one of the other issue, interesting issues is China's, I mean, rather Russia has now tried to uh, deal with being cut off from the international financial system and the credit card system by kind of joining China's alternative. Uh, we will see whether an alliance, if you will, a, a uh, financial uh, grouping of Russia, China, perhaps India, uh, Brazil, some of the other countries can be formed and if it will be strong enough to, uh, to sustain uh, Russia. I don't think so. I think being cut off uh, from Europe, cut off from the United States, North America, cut off from other uh, parts of the world is going to be such a drag on certainly Russia, but also China, that it may in the end, if this goes on much longer, be forced to take some kind of action or at least uh, behind the scenes nudge Putin. Different questions, same to, still to you, uh, Dan. Of course, we all rejoice in seeing uh, you know, more spirit going back into this old uh, North Atlantic uh, uh, treaty organization. By the way, for whatever is worth, on April 4th, we should be celebrating, right? The anniversary of the Washington Treaty. Never, I never seen a headline say, oh, this is NATO's anniversary. Usually never happens. Maybe this year something will be done. I have no idea. 
or maybe it's not the moment to celebrate when, when, when such tragedy is unfolding. However, this brings also to the table the, no, the, the issue, not just of German uh, decisions to you know, reverse course and increase defense spending and probably other European countries following, but also here in the United States. You know, defense spending is uh, as, as big as it is and as extraordinarily large as people say, oh my God, the US, the biggest defense budget in the world, et cetera. But our capabilities has shrunk, have shrunk significantly. The Chinese Navy is bigger than the US Navy right now. We, we, you know, they are called to do too many things and there's just no capability. Do you see there a bipartisan support now in, in Washington then for you know, increased defense spending on a significant basis? We're, we're certainly ahead than the 2%, but we're still, what, 3%, some, somewhere there? You know, in the Reagan years, it, was, it went up to 6%, if I'm not mistaken, in, in, you know, at least once or twice. So do you see support for rebuilding capabilities and, uh, and, uh, and, and strengthening uh, everything because we need to do everything from the Navy to, to, to the Marine Corps, to the whole thing. Is that gonna last with our enormous yearly uh, federal budget deficits and uh, astronomic uh, you know, national debt increased in large measure due to the extraordinary expenditures for COVID and stimulus and, and all that? Do you see enough of a political consensus under President Biden now to, we've seen an increase in defense spending now, but that's not enough. Is it sustainable? Are we gonna do that in the US? Dan. Your voice. Yep. Uh, no, I, I, think, I think we are likely to see this, maybe not over a very long period of time, but certainly over the next three, four, even five years, a shift in, uh, in the balance of power in Congress will exacerbate this or will push this along. Uh, because I now think that in fact, the US military, which sort of wanted to say, we will focus on one theater, this being the Indo-Pacific and kind of give a little bit of attention to Europe and the Middle East, but we're going to be essentially a, a one theater military is now found itself having to be a two theater military, which is uh, a lot more. Uh, even if or until at least NATO, the allies uh, come up with more forces. So I think this is, going, this is going to go. Will it be enough? Not clear. Will it be more? Certainly. Will more of those forces be deployed forward? Which is I think terribly important because they are a deterrent. But on the other hand, particularly to Putin, you know, watching things flow into Eastern Europe, perhaps permanently, I would bet on permanent basing of US forces now in Poland and the Baltic, uh, it's gonna be seen as a reason to ramp up his military spending if he survives. And I think the same thing with respect to China, that there's gonna be a desire to in fact do more in the way of military spending, even as they struggle economically and with their own demographic problems. So I think uh, things are going to get tenser, which will do uh, a lot to uh, keep U.S. defense spending higher than it would otherwise be. Michael, to you, uh, you know, essentially the same question about sustainability. I think it was not long ago that President Macron, right, had declared in an interview to, was it to The Economist, if I'm not mistaken, that NATO was brain dead? Yep. Uh, okay, from brain dead to, I don't know, resuscitated, I, we've used here uh, our more positive, uh, you know, verb reborn. Uh, but really, that's what we're talking about now. We're talking about re reigniting a spirit of cooperation, and in which NATO was created to protect Western Europe from potential Russian expansionism way, way, way back uh, in the 19, late 1940s. Can we recreate that spirit and, and make this thing work in a sense that is a, appropriate and realistic to say NATO was created as a defensive alliance, it will continue to, uh, to be a defensive alliance, but in order to be credible, it has to have a real deterrent that can give you know, some pause to a would-be aggressor, namely Putin. Do you see how, how you know, as we are winding up now, we're getting to the end of our time, is that realistic? Do you see public opinion, major parties in Great Britain, of course, is a key NATO ally from day one, and from your perspective there in London, looking at Europe, that that is actually the message and that countries and governments are responding to that and say, yes, 
Unfortunately, we would rather not do this, but we have to, or not. Yes, well, I think for Britain, it's a slightly difficult message because of course, everybody is very impressed with and supportive of the extraordinary unity shown, not simply in terms of defense, you know, priorities given now to defense and deterrence, but political unity. The idea that even Switzerland was ready, dropping its neutrality, ready to sanction Russia for its behavior. Uh, a painful lesson for Britain because it has shown more and more people here that Brexit was a dreadful mistake, that um, cutting our links institutionally with the European Union was the stupidest thing this country has done for hundreds of years, I would say. Uh, and as a result, we're trying slowly, <coughs> but of course this government will never say so, we're trying slowly to rebuild political relations with our European colleagues uh, in terms of political cooperation, in terms of unity of action, in terms of how we decide what we should do in uh, for refugees or for sanctions or whatever it is. I can only see that as a good thing. Um, I don't, it's too late for Britain to say, whoops, we made a terrible mistake, we'll get back into Europe. Uh, but slowly, slowly, we can try to rebuild those links. And extraordinarily, um, <clears throat> this crisis has done a lot to do so. Uh, it has cemented political ideology and aspirations. That's the key thing that the West has actually suddenly discovered that freedom and democracy are not just slogans, and not just slogans of the 1960s or 50s, they mean something now. And that is important, and that is why it will be possible I think to take decisive collective action with everyone more or less facing in the same direction. And that's, I think, one of the few and lucky spin offs from this dreadful tragedy. Thank you, Michael. Egon, to you, and I'm afraid we're getting to the end here. Do you, how do you see the same thing? And also, a particular question to you about managing this uh, incredibly uh, potent, uh, I would say, um, refugee flows from from Ukraine. And we talk about 2 million people displaced. And you know, there's, so many, there's only so many that Poland and Hungary can take. Is there a plan in Europe and maybe beyond to absorb this uh, flow of people, mostly women and children, but others too, that are being displaced from Ukraine and coming into Europe? But so these two questions, you see this thing lasting and a new NATO nerve and, and backbone being recreated for good, and also how to help the Ukrainians in this uh, humanitarian crisis. Let me start with the NATO uh, question. Um, I think uh, for a long time, NATO had a problem uh, with his uh, raison d'etre, so the sense of existing. And I remember when I uh, made interviews with uh, NATO generals, uh, what happened in the night after the fall of the Berlin Wall when the NATO uh, generals realized the enemy is away, enemy is gone after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And um, so it was very interesting. And now they have a raison d'etre again, and uh, they are stronger than in the last time. And uh, even neutral countries like uh, Finland and Sweden have the idea of uh, joining NATO one day, maybe. Um, so this is my answer to NATO. And uh, the solidarity with the refugees is enormous in Europe, um, especially in Poland. Um, Poland was criticized very much like the other uh, Visegrad uh, countries, so Hungary uh, especially, uh, for not accepting um, refugees coming from Africa and North Africa from uh, Arabic uh, countries in 2015 and 16. And uh, now they show that they are willing and welcoming uh, the neighbors of, of the same culture region of course, there's a big difference. And uh, the Poland's uh, even had the same position when the East Germans uh, tried to, to flee and to escape yeah? uh, the GDR. And uh, also Poland was extremely helpful. And now again, and uh, the Germans, uh, so uh, five walking distance, five minutes walking distance from my office where I am talking, um, there is the main 
the central station in Berlin, and there is a big tent uh, for the refugees coming uh, with uh, by the trains from Ukraine, and you can see the tragedies in front, nearly in the front of the press house where I'm sitting, and um, so. This solidarity will continue. Germany has some experience from 2015 and 16 in organizing um, yeah, instruments and um, also um, real estate, so places to, to stay in the different uh, 16 states of Germany. And this experience is helpful now because uh, at the other time, uh, they had a lot of problems and uh, and now the solidarity of course is is better than 2015 and 16 because we have europeans here and not um, arabs that, for many people that's uh, that's uh, a difference well gentlemen i really thank you very very much for this uh tour de force here today and uh giving us a sense of what's happening based on your observation you know, I, I can only conclude by saying that the, that the Romans had it right, you know, if you want peace, get ready for war, right? Uh, so build a strong deterrent. And I think that's, we've, we're beginning to learn this, uh, you know, again, it's a lesson that apparently it's easy to forget when things are fine, then you let your guard down and, and you say, hey, everything is fine, there's no problem here and there. But unfortunately, we are reminded that bad guys uh, come back uh, every now and then, and we don't know what will be the future or the fate of Vladimir Putin, but that may be not the, the end of it. Let's say he's gone. Do we have any guarantee that the next guy who will be in charge in the Kremlin would be any better? I have no idea. You know, it's not going to be a Jeffersonian Democrat. So with that, uh, let's hope indeed that NATO find its, uh, you know, its, its spirit and, and, and sustain it because that's the really important. And that um, as, as tragic as it is for the Ukrainians, uh, they gave us a lesson in fortitude and, and resilience, which is, um, I hope, to be treasured by all of us watching their, their fight and hope that we can help them to the best of our, of our ability. And with that, on behalf of Bay Atlantic University and, uh, and the Global Policy Institute, I want to thank all of you and thank our audience for participating. And uh, we stand adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.